Mind and Matter by G. F. Stout. Book 2, Chapter 4. Transition to the Criticism of Materialism. 1. The Question at Issue. We are not concerned with materialism as a purely scientific generalization, but as a metaphysical theory claiming to be based on scientific evidence. We assume that from the standpoint of science, mind and mental occurrences are found to exist when, and only when, certain material processes take place in living bodies. But metaphysical materialism takes a further step of tremendous significance. It asserts that the material conditions which in the phenomenal order are uniformly present whenever mind is present, of themselves constitute the entire cause which immediately produces mind. What I deny is this either follows from the scientific evidence or is in itself tenable. On the contrary, I shall argue that the beginning of this or that mind essentially depends on pre-existing mind. In other words, that mind in general is not produced at all, but is, in some way, involved as a primary factor in the original constitution of the universe. In asserting this, I take the terms mind and mental as essentially involving experience. No other meaning is relevant to the ensuing discussion. There is mind, in my sense of the word, whenever anything is experienced in the way, for example, of sensation, feeling, thinking, or striving. Inversely, where nothing is experienced, there is no mind, in any sense, which is relevant to the present question. An individual mind is an experiencing individual as such. Whatever else may be true about him, he is a mind only inasmuch as he lives through some kind of experience. What I mean by mere and merely when I speak of mere matter or merely material conditions is the absolute absence of any kind or grade of experiencing. This being presupposed, it makes no difference to the argument what else is included or not included in the conception of matter. It makes no difference whether we ascribe to it only primary qualities or also secondary. Similarly, force and energy, whether regarded as positively real or as merely conceptual formulas, may, for our present purpose, be treated as material provided always that we carefully and strictly exclude any animistic view of their nature. If we read into them, however obscurely and unwittingly, anything analogous to our own experience of striving and effort, of doing and undergoing, we are already presupposing mind instead of starting from what is merely material. On the same principle, we must not think of life as a middle stage, bridging the passage from lifeless matter to mind. We have to decide between two exclusive alternatives. We may assume, however dimly and vaguely, that guiding and directing mind is required to account for the distinctive nature of vital process. On this view, there is mind already wherever there is life. And the only relevant question which remains concerns the transition from lifeless to living matter. On the other hand, we may assume that life is no more than a highly complex system of material processes. Then, however peculiar this complex system may be in other ways, it is, so far as concerns our present problem, on the same level as other merely material occurrences. 2. Why it is to be approached from the psychophysical standpoint. I approach the problem in the first instance 
by way of the relation of body and mind. I thus find myself confronted directly with the prima facie scientific evidence in favor of materialism, and, in dealing with it, I have to think and speak in terms of causality and other categories of the physical sciences. I do so because there is no other way of meeting materialism on its own ground. But it may be held that the procedure is unphilosophical. The right course, it may be said, is rather to start from the relation of mind as subject to the material world and to the universe in general as its object. This is the order followed, e.g., by the late Dr. Boson K. My reason for not adopting it is that it offers no secure prospect of coming to close quarters with the problems I am here raising. The question of the way we know external objects is initially distinct from the questions which gather round the association of minds with those particular portions of matter we call living organisms. We may feel that these questions must in some way be connected, and connected so that the first ought to throw light on the second. We may feel, for instance, that it would be strange and paradoxical if minds, which are spectators of all time and all existence, were merely transient products of conditions occurring here and there, if they were merely stray bubbles on the ocean of matter. There is a paradox here but it is harder to show clearly and definitely that there is any real inconsistency. In order that the two lines of inquiry may be made to help each other, we must effect a junction between them, and in order to do this, we have to keep both in view, and, so to speak, to start independently from both ends. And I find it easier and more advantageous to begin with the relation of body and mind. If we start from the subject-object relation, and, descending to the mind-body problem, treat it, when we come to it, wholly or mainly from this point of view, we run, as I have said, a serious risk of never fairly grappling with materialism on its own ground. Instead, we hover over it in a superior region. Thus, Dr. Bosenke, after developing an elaborate idealistic system for the universe as a whole, when he comes to the more special problem, virtually takes the case for materialism at its face value, without further examination. Of course, it would be absurd to call him a materialist. Still, he could hardly be said to meet and criticize the reasons for materialism as the materialist himself conceives them. Consider again the peculiar position and fate of Bishop Barclay's philosophy. According to Barclay, the material world consists merely of a fixed and systematic order of sense presentations, possible and actual. Further, he holds that sense presentations exist only in being actually perceived, that their esse is percipi. He does not attempt, from this point of view, to give any definite account of the relation of body and mind. He ignores the problem as if he were purposely evading it. And, indeed, it is a peculiarly awkward one for him to answer. Yet, it may well seem at first sight that he has left no place for materialistic views. Certainly, he meant to leave no place for them, and thought that he had completely excluded them. But, in this he appears to have been mistaken. When we come to work out his theory of matter in detail, it turns out that the occurrence of actual sense experiences is determined by the systematic order of possible sense experiences. In fact, for him, possibilities play the part of realities. They are thought of as persisting, changing, and interacting with each other, just as if they were actual existences. Now... Let us suppose not only that actual sense presentations are thus dependent on the systematic order of possible sense presentations, but also that minds and their varying sense experiences are similarly conditioned in their origin, continuance, and cessation. Then we have a form of materialism. As a matter of fact, Mr. Bertrand Russell at one time accepted and most ably and ingeniously developed what is essentially a form of Barclay's theory. Yet, Mr. Russell, so far as I understand him, is quite definitely a materialist, and does not object to being called by the name. 
footnote. Or, he was so at one stage of his erratic career. End footnote. Of course, there are other parts of Barclay's system which are really inconsistent with materialism, but his special theory of matter taken by itself does not exclude it. Nor is there anything in Kant which either excludes it or requires it, if we set aside his practical philosophy. It is otherwise with Leibniz, Lotze, and Spinoza. But it is characteristic of these thinkers that they approach the problem from both sides. Spinoza, for instance, devotes the first book of his ethics to a general theory of the universe and of the relation of thought to extension as its object. He then, in the second book, takes a relatively new start from the relation of body and mind and man. He endeavors to bring the two inquiries into unity so as to make his account of body and mind a special development of his general philosophy. Nonetheless, in order to do this, he has to find a relatively independent point of departure in the more special problem, and this is one of the main reasons why his philosophy is interesting. Though, we ought to keep both problems independently in view until we find them to converge. It is, at the outset, open to us to start from either of them. I choose to begin with the relation of mind and body, as this appears to the physiologist and physicist. I do so because this is the only way of directly grappling with the positive case for materialism, as based on scientific evidence. 3. Why the scientific evidence is inadequate. After what has been said in Book 1, it is not necessary to treat this topic at length. If the limits of science were coincident with the limits of knowledge or reasonable belief, the position of the materialist would be unassailable. But, from the nature of the scientific understanding, this is a false assumption. The conditions which must be taken account of in order to assign general rules of sequence, coexistence, and covariation need not be the whole of the conditions on which events really depend. There may be, and in fact there constantly is, a background of other conditions which are not specified. All that is required is that there shall be a ground for counting with sufficient probability on the presence of such conditions, whatever they may be. This is the course followed in all inductive reasoning, and constitutes the reason why induction always falls short of absolute certainty, however great the probability which it may attain. The scientific evidence, we may admit, shows that the transient existence of finite minds and mental processes always depends on material occurrences, but it cannot, from the nature of the case, prove that it depends on nothing else. It is therefore an inadequate basis for metaphysical as distinct from scientific materialism. The materialist will answer that as experience yields no definite and detailed evidence of the existence of mind except in connection with the bodily organisms of men and animals, there is an overwhelming presumption that the rest of the universe is mindless. Footnote. Common sense animism is, of course, too vague for the purposes of science. End footnote. It is doubtless true that the sort of evidence on which science relies is found only in connection with animal life. Before, however, jumping to the conclusion that mind does not exist where such evidence is not found, we must first answer another question. Assuming that mind really is universally present in nature, have we any reason to count on finding definite and detailed evidence of its presence except where we actually do find it? When once this issue is raised, it becomes plain that from the very nature of the evidence, its range must be narrowly limited. It consists primarily in the knowledge which each of us has of his own existence as a self-conscious being. In the second place, it consists in the knowledge which each of us has of the existence of other minds through interpretation of the behavior of bodies other than his own. And this is possible only if the bodily behavior is sufficiently akin or responsive to our own. The less definitely these conditions are fulfilled, the more vague and uncertain becomes the inference. 
It is most definite and sure for human beings, and becomes more indefinite and precarious as we descend in the scale of animal life. But it seems a very unjustifiable anthropomorphism to assert that mind does not exist where these special conditions fail, under which alone its existence can be revealed in this way to us. We ought perhaps rather to argue that since it is found where we have a fair chance of definitely recognizing its presence, there is a presumption that it exists where such evidence is not accessible. The same point may be put in another way. Suppose a mind, widely removed in its nature and the conditions of its existence from our own, suppose also that this mind has a very comprehensive and detailed knowledge of the material world, including the living bodies of men and animals. It might nonetheless fail to interpret the behavior of humans and animal bodies as evidence of the existence of human and animal minds. It might, for instance, find human bodies behaving so as to produce aeroplanes, or the bodies of bees behaving so as to produce honeycombs. Such events suggest a teleological order, the direction of process towards an end. But there is also a teleological order in the material world in general, especially in the immensely complex adaptations of the organic life of plants and animals, including the way in which living organisms are themselves produced and modified and developed in the course of evolution. Such a mind, as we are assuming, might simply regard the making of aeroplanes or of honeycombs as incidental to this general teleological order, the order itself it might take to be an ultimate fact, or attempt to explain it, let us say, by natural selection. Or again, finding such views unsatisfactory, it might go beyond the scientific evidence and postulate the general presence of mind in nature. The suggestion that besides this universal mind, there are also individual minds in men and bees which help to account for aeroplanes and honeycombs would appear to it as perhaps possible, but as a rather wild hypothesis. However minute its scientific knowledge of the human brain, it would see nothing there to suggest mental life, any more than in the process of digestion and respiration. Now, if there are minds sufficiently remote from our own in their connections and modes of behavior, we should, in like manner, lack scientific evidence of their existence. A fortiori, we should lack scientific evidence of the existence of a universal mind. 4. Plan of Treatment It follows that the evidence on which the materialist relies can, at the most, only justify him in claiming that his view should be provisionally accepted unless grounds can be shown for rejecting it. There is no presumption in its favor which can outweigh positive reasons against it. In the next three chapters, I proceed to give three arguments against it which, taken together and coupled with the animism of common sense, seem to me conclusive. Two of these start from the methods of science itself. On the first may be called the argument from the order of nature. Its aim is to show that the supposed production of mind by purely material factors is utterly incongruous with the scientific conception of the order of nature as a system of laws. The second may be called the argument from the persistent of the changing in change. Production everywhere else involves for science the continuance of the producing factors in the product, but in the supposed production of mind by matter, there is an absolute breach of such continuity. This breach of continuity is not only utterly incongruous with the general scientific view of nature, it is itself quite unintelligible. The third argument is based on the agency of experiencing individuals as such. We have cogent reasons for regarding will and intelligence as contributing to determine the course of events. But this is quite incompatible with metaphysical materialism.